Hi, and welcome to this lecture, which is on the poem Remains by Simon Armitage. Um, this is a poem that was written in about 2007, um, and we're just going to go through what the main focuses of this lecture are before I start going through the poem with you. So, what skills is this lecture seeking to develop in you as a student and in your ability to understand a poem? Uh, and we've got quite a broad selection of different things that we're going to look at today, but hopefully this will keep them sharp enough that you can see the, the kind of logic of where we're trying to go with this. So, first of all, we're trying to develop an ability to engage with a poem in its historical context. So we're going to start the lecture with a little bit of uh, context, which I think is important for this poem, just so we can understand what Armitage was trying to do when he wrote it and what his kind of message to the reader was and what he was trying to convey to us. Secondly, I want us to really focus today on the way a poet uses language to shape images particularly and how those images impact upon the reader. So at any point in this lecture where we're talking about language, we're specifically looking at how language creates a picture in our head which allows us to kind of experience what the soldier who is the voice of the poem was experiencing. Uh, and then we're also going to look at the structure of the poem. This poem um, has got quite a strong structure, I would say, or certainly a structure where we can break it down into components. And the kind of the backbone of this lecture is going to be looking at those different components of the poem and seeing how we can kind of piece them together and what the impact of having these clear sections is. Uh, and then finally, I want us to think about the characteristics and the texture of a poem. So how do the different techniques and strategies and ways of writing that Armitage uses, how do they give the poem a kind of texture and a feel which is impactful upon the reader? So let's start with some questions. And at this point, if you're doing this at home, you might want to pause this and just talk about these questions to get your brain engaged and start thinking about the kind of things that this poem might talk about. Uh, so some big questions here are what remains after war. The poem is called Remains and it's a title that comes with a lot of different meanings in the poem and really talks about what does remain after a war. So when we think about war we might think of bodies, we might think of the way the landscape is affected by war, we might think about the memories of the soldiers and how those memories uh, impact upon them after the war not just during it. We might think about patriotism for fighting, you know, do soldiers still believe in the cause at the end of the war? Um, we might think of our own identity, does war sort of impact the identity of all of us? Does it have a, an effect on national or international consciousness? And does it change any relationships that are made? So big questions about what remains after war. Um, I'm going to read the poem to you in a moment, but first of all I just want to go through a little bit of contextual information. Okay, the poem was written in 2007 and it was for a collection called The Not Dead that Simon Armitage did. So it was a collection of poetry that talked about the experiences of survivors of war. What, what was it like to not be dead at the end of a war and what did it mean that you had to carry with you afterwards? And in that documentary, and you can, if you Google this you'll find it on YouTube um, for this poem, he interviewed different soldiers. And this poem is very much taken from the interviews he had with a particular soldier and the incident that the poem describes really happened to this soldier. And in this incident, what happened was they, they had seen um, a looter, which is someone that if there's a battle in war and everyone runs away and the shops and the banks and the stores are empty, someone that kind of comes in and tries to rob that area when it's shut. And they, they had a duty to stop looting. And uh, him and a couple of other soldiers opened fire on this looter and killed him. And what happens later is the soldier, after the war, can't get this memory out of his head. And it does him a lot of damage and he turns to drugs and alcohol. And one really telling thing that, that struck me when I watched the documentary was he says that he went to his uh, senior officer and said, you know, I'm struggling here, my mental health is... Uh, bad, I'm not coping well with what I've seen and what I've been through. And the officer said to him, well, why don't you try and go and do a, a basket weaving course? So basically insinuating that he was weak and he was feeble and that was all the help he got. 
And I think Armitage really wanted to expose that, you know, soldiers suffer, that these people we send to war for the, on the um, orders of what a country is trying to do, do suffer in that war. And the poem is trying to expose that. So I'm going to read it out and then we will start going through it bit by bit. On another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank. And one of them legs it up the road, probably armed. Possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire. Three of a kind. Or let him fly. And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself. The image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story. Except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street and put on patrol I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave but I blink. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep. He's probably armed, possibly not. Dream. And he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here, in my head when I close my eyes. Dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead. In some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land. Or six feet under, in desert sand. But near to the knuckle, here and now. His bloody life, in my bloody hands. I think it's probably one of the most powerful poems in this anthology because we really get inside the mind of this man and the suffering he's enduring after serving in this war. So I'm going to suggest a series of sections to the poem here to look at the structure. And as we go through each section structurally, I'm going to talk a bit about the language and the imagery and how that impacts upon us. So section one is the problem. On another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding right a bank, and one of them legs up the road, probably armed, possibly not. So the soldiers are presented with a simple problem. There's a looter. The problem is they don't know if he's armed or not. So what do you do? You've got to make a decision. If you assume he's not armed and you leave him, you're at risk. Otherwise, you've got to kill him. So that's the decision that's got to be made. But what Armitage really pulls off well here is two things, I would say, in the language. Firstly, the regularity of this sort of thing on another occasion. This is not some major event. This is the kind of experience, which would be extraordinary to most people, that the soldiers are going through every day. And then secondly, the casual tone. If we look at words like probably, possibly, maybe, they're almost shrugged off. There's a very light tone to it. It doesn't feel like a big event at the moment. And that casual tone continues into the second section, which I've labelled the solution. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind, so all three of us open fire. And I think, again, there's that casual tone. Well, there's me and a couple of other people, and we've all got the same idea. We're all going to shoot him. And it just seems so normal, so every day. There's a, a lack of thought put into it. It's just routine. And I think that tells us a lot that, you know, after the war, he's looking back and he's thinking, God, this awful thing, the, the killing of someone, the taking of life, had become just a thing that me and somebody else and somebody else does. And the repetition here and the slightly longer line give this sense that it's just, this is what we do, this is what we're all about. Um, and of course, they all open fire, three of a kind or let him fly. And it's this sense that all three of them are shooting. So there's this real aggression to it and they're all in unison and it's almost automated. They've become almost robotic in what they're doing. And then he ends this part of the poem, and I swear, and then we cut straight through to, I see every round as it rips through his life. And in that shift from one stanza to the next, the tone completely changes and we enter this section of the poem which I'm calling the brutality. It is so suddenly brutal and aggressive. If we look at the sort of alliterative phrasing, round as it rips, 
we can really get a sense of the images here, that this man's body is being torn apart. But it doesn't just rip through his body, it rips through his life. And he's very aware, the soldier, that he's taken someone's life. In this sense, I see broad daylight on the other side, and again, the imagery is visceral and it's grotesque and it's realistic, that he can see through this man. He's shot a hole straight through his body. And that's the kind of image that sticks with him, the kind of image that later we'll see you can't get rid of. So we've hit this looter a dozen times. Now there's an excessiveness about this, isn't there? The three of them in unison shooting, and the guy's been shot now 12 times at least. So there's a real brutality, but I think it comes from the routineness of the operation that we saw earlier. And he's there on the ground. And then I think possibly one of the most powerful lines of the poem, sort of inside out. And the power of this line, kind of ironically, comes from its lack of power. It's such a throwaway line, sort of inside out. Again, kind of shrugged off, like it's meaningless. And he, in this language here, is kind of objectifying this person. A minute ago, he's ripping through someone's life. He's really aware of his humanity. But here we see that in the action of it all, in the event, in the war itself, He's treated like an object, like a thing, sort of inside out, but whatever. Then we move on to stanza four, the body. And he really goes into detail here, and we see the kind of images that are stuck in his head that are haunting him later on. Pain itself, the image of agony. And we are given a very stark image of this man writhing around and dying as his life kind of ebbs out of him. But then again, we're back to the casual tone, that although the effect on his mind might be pain itself, the image of agony, something that's going to stick with him forever, in the moment, it's treated just as a throwaway thing. It's just another day. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. It is such a grotesquely violent image. Tosses his guts back into his body. It resonates so powerfully with the reader. The imagery is so strong. But the tone is so casual, like tossing a piece of rubbish in the bin, throwing something away, discarding something. It doesn't feel important in its tone, but when we consider what we're looking at, it's really profound. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry, and he almost literally, in this image, becomes rubbish. He's thrown in the back of the lorry, he's taken away, this man has ceased to exist. And it's that coldness in the moment that later on the soldier struggles to cope with. If we go to stanza five, uh, I'm calling that the stain. So the idea that there is a stain, and this is where the imagery becomes really powerful and kind of more layered. So there's this very powerful line here, end of story, except not really. Of course it's not the end, it's the end for the man, he's dead, he's taken away. But it's not the end for the soldier. Because he says his blood shadow stays on the street. Now this blood shadow becomes kind of metaphorical. At first there's a literal blood shadow, i.e. where the man was killed, there is blood on the street, it is stained, it is bloody. He can see it. But of course that washes away, that disappears. A bit like the blood on Lady Macbeth's hands, you know, it goes, it's not there forever. But for the soldier... It's a constant reminder of him, and the shadow becomes almost like a metaphor, a memory of the soldier. And every day he's out on patrol, and he's literally walking over the spot where he knows that the soldier, that the, uh, that the looter was killed. He's walking over the metaphorical shadow of the dead body. So he's kind of having to relive this experience every day, which is incredibly intense and unpleasant for him. Um, and then... I'm home on leave. And what's interesting about that line is it's so sudden. Then I'm home on leave. It's happened. He's not there anymore. He's gone home. But I blink and notice that Simon Armitage leaves a pause here. That's the end of the stanza. Full stop on leave. But I blink. Three syllables. Du, du, du. And we're almost invited to pause and think, well, what does happen when you blink? What is the effect of this? What have you taken home with you? And in stanza five... The dream is revealed to us. I blink and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep and he's probably armed, possibly not. Dream and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And all of a sudden there's a sudden, 
uh, increase in the pace, the tone, lots of single syllable words, lots of powerful, almost onomatopoeic words, bursts, uh, torn apart, dozen rounds. And what we also get is a slight shift, the same line, probably are and possibly not, but moved further down the line and has this more intense kind of pace and speed to it. So there's this sense that as he relives the experience, it's almost more intense than it was when he first experienced it. When he killed the looter, at the time it seemed casual, but in his dreams it seems brutal and appalling and shocking and um, impossible to kind of eject from his mind. And in trying to get rid of it, it's clear that what he does is he turns to drink and to drugs, and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. But they don't work. And Armitage puts this little hyphen here to kind of leave it hanging. It doesn't matter how many drugs he takes. It doesn't matter how much he drinks. It doesn't matter what he does to himself. He cannot push away these thoughts. Uh, I suppose it's a post-traumatic stress that he cannot uh, get rid of. Um, then in stanza seven, which we're calling the haunting, it's this sense that this really is forever now. What the war has done to him has fundamentally changed the way he thinks and the way he operates. And his ability to do the simplest things, you know. He can't sleep, he can't dream. Uh, sorry, he can't sleep, he does dream. And when he dreams, it's this horror and this reliving of these awful uh, incidents. So in stanza seven, the haunting. He's here in my head when I close my eyes. And I think we get a real sense of empathy for the soldier here. That Armitage is bringing in these pronouns, he, I, I, my head. He's here in my head when I close my eyes. And it's such a simple thing, isn't it, to be able to close your eyes, to rest, to reflect on the day. And he can't, because every time he does, this horror kind of swoops in. And it is completely inescapable. Dug in behind enemy lines. And notice the shorter line here. There's an intensity to it. And also not remembering being dug in behind enemy lines not reliving being dug in behind enemy lines but dug in behind enemy lines like it's happening now it's not like a memory for him it's like a constant living of the same thing over and over again like it's happening all the time the second his eyes shut he is back there not he's remembering it he's reliving it he's there the moment he's like he's almost like he's trapped in time not left for dead in some distant, sun-stunned, sand-smothered land. That's a hard line to read. But you can hear the sibilance. It gives a sort of stuttering kind of anger to it, or a kind of horror, or a sense that his nerves are frayed. And the much, much longer line demands that it's read quickly. And there's a sort of anger to it. Actually, if you look up the original poem, you will see that this is the only poem in the anthology where there's been a slight edit made for GCSE because this line is slightly swearier in the original version. And I think it's that the, the, the soldier is frustrated and also angry that this has been done to him, you know, that on orders he has kind of, uh, again to make a Macbeth reference, filed his mind, he's worn himself down, he's kind of broken himself. Or well, six feet under in desert sand. And there's a sense, this very familiar phrase, six feet under, to mean dead, buried. It's a sort of colloquialism. But with desert sand, which to a British soldier is a very foreign phrase, that the death is elsewhere. But although it may be elsewhere, it is trapped in his mind. And then finally, stanza eight, the remains. So what does remain? But near to the knuckle, here and now. Such a powerful phrase, such a violent phrase, the idea of being near to the knuckle, of being close to the bone, of being part of him. This memory, this experience, this new existence, it is chained to him, it is grafted to him, it is part of his being. Uh, and finally, his bloody life in my bloody hands. And the repetition here of bloody, with the pronouns of his and my, really emphasising the guilt that he feels, that he feels this man's life was in his hands. Despite the fact that he was one of three, despite the fact that he was operating on orders, despite the fact that logically you can say he was a soldier fighting a war, the man was a looter, he was doing his job. 
that doesn't assuage the guilt, that doesn't assuage the blood-stained memories that won't let him live a normal life, that won't even let him sleep. So what remains for him is that, the memories, the guilt, the suffering, the horror, and the sort of fundamental change in who he is and how he copes with life. So to sum up, what kind of things can we say that Armitage does, technical things in this poem that really emphasise its meaning and really help us to feel that we understand the soldier's experience and that we empathise and feel sorry for the soldier and his guilt and his suffering. I'm going to suggest four things. There are more, but here are some of them just summarised. He uses a lot of violent imagery. I see every round as it rips through his life, tosses his guts, inside out, carted up, torn apart by a dozen rounds. It's full of violence. He uses metaphors and symbolism right the way through. Rips through his life. The blood shadow stays on the street, that powerful metaphor that haunts him. And then his bloody life in my bloody hands. And we see that as well as blood coming up again. The imagery, like the poem, is dripping in blood. He uses repetition, but particularly repetition of kind of vague or tentative phrases. So things like, one of them legs up the road, or probably aren't, possibly not, end of story except not really, myself and somebody else and somebody else, sort of inside out, sleep and he's probably aren't, possibly not. There's this lack of surety, it's like there's no certainty about whether his actions, his life, his career, the things he's done have been right or wrong. Uh, and there's a, it also kind of uh, gives this sense of his fragility, I think, that he's not confident, that he's a, a broken man, hence the sort of tentativeness and the lack of surety about what he's saying. And then finally, very visceral, to, you know, to do with the body, to do with the inside of the body and the parts of the body, kind of gory almost, visceral and immersive narrative perspective, near to the knuckle here and now, so inside him, on the bones. He bursts again through the door. So it's there, it's in your face, it's violent, it's full on, it's immersive, it throws you into the poem. He's here in my head when I close my eyes. The eyes, the brain, the fact that it's inside his body. Dream and he's torn apart and we literally see the body torn to pieces. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. So again this idea that this experience is grafted into him and cannot be uh, undone. So what I want you to think about is these three big questions in the end. What remains after the war of the body, of the place, and of the soul of the soldier? Thank you.